This is our hope and joy. Without Christ, there is no hope of being in heaven. Right. You may keep the Ten Commandment law. You may keep all the biblical principles. You may keep the Sabbath. But unless you have a one-on-one personal relationship with Jesus and you daily strive to be more like Jesus and you're studying your word and you're praying and your sincere desire is to be in heaven unless you follow that path every day you'll eventually you will stray and you will leave the church is anybody with me today again we thank you for your prayers and for your friendship and all of your financial support that's keeping these doors open so we can continue to move forward for the lovely Jesus Christ. But again, the message today is entitled, The Broad Shoulders of Christ. Now, before we go into the message, uh, uh, last night I was working on this. It's a prelude to the message. Um, I wanted to let you know why it's only Jesus and His broad shoulders. Because He was God in the flesh. Can someone say Amen. Mortal man could not do what Jesus did. It was Jesus wrapped in human form that he is the son of God that give him the power and the love and the grace to be able to carry that cross of Calvary's hill. But let us go back a few hours before he carried the cross. I want you to listen to what I have to say. Now, what I'm talking about today is historical facts that you won't find in the Bible. It's historical facts, and I want you to listen very carefully. Before Christ's crucifixion in the judgment hall, the Bible says that he was beaten with the fist of the Roman soldiers. They said that they grabbed his beard and they ripped the beard from his face. Is anybody with me? It says the soldiers were ordered to tie Jesus to what they called a whipping post and to be whipped with whips that were designed to tear the flesh and the muscles and cause pain that cannot be pinned or comprehended. you got to remember that this all took place before Christ went up Calvary's hill, that there was a post, and they tied his hands to the top of the post. And this is what happened. Jesus was stripped of his clothing. He was naked. Come on. And they took these whips, and they were designed with sharp sheep bones that were crushed up with tiny metal balls, and they were twined into the whips. They were designed not only to tear the flesh, but to rip the muscle from the bone. Is anybody with me? And the soldiers would beat these men, and many of them died because they bled to death. Is anybody with me? And they would mock Christ, and they cursed Christ, and they laughed at Christ because he was naked. And they beat his back, they beat his buttocks, they beat his legs, and it says in historical that it was merciless. It was a violent beating. Many bled to death. Many went into shock and died. But listen to this. The cross was not a smooth like these pews here. They were rugged, Rosemary. They were designed after a person was beaten that when they laid them on the cross, the bark would dig into the flesh. Is anybody with me? They were designed for pain. Jesus had to carry the wooden cross of torture for 2,000 feet before he got to Golgotha's hill. But the Bible says, because of the blood loss and no water and no food, because his muscles were turned away from his body, Jesus fell to the ground. Now, when Christ was on the cross, with the nails in his hands and feet, because the muscles were turned from, torn from his body, he wasn't able to pull himself up to get a real deep breath, fresh of air. Because he said the muscles were torn away from him. And in the midst of his torture, they offered him vinegar and myrrh. Now what that was, Jan, it was given to them to help with the pain. But Jesus said, I don't want any. I want nothing. Every breath 
that he took. Historians say that Jesus took, put the weight on his feet, and took his legs, and he pushed himself up to get a breath. His last breath was, Lord, Heavenly Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus was the only one on this planet with broad enough shoulders to carry all the sins of humanity to the cross. So many things went on behind the scenes before he carried the cross, but the Bible says that Jesus willingly and lovingly went to the cross to die for me because he loved me. Is anybody with me today? So you're going to find out today that no mortal man was able to carry what Christ carried. It took some broad shoulders. But here's the sad part. Here's what the historian said. That even though Christ had broad shoulders and muscled shoulders from his work, when it came right down to it, he was so weak, his body began to sag, and his shoulders just dropped. Come on, somebody. Now, that's the God that I serve. I don't serve a tyrannical God. I serve a God that's gracious and loving and kind and merciful. He knows all about me. And even though God knows all about me, he still loves me with all my problems and my issues. Can somebody say amen to that? Is anybody with me today? All right, let's go to our message today. The broad shoulders of Jesus Christ. The past couple of weeks, I'll just read this to you. The past couple of weeks, here's what we've been studying here. These are the messages that we've been given. We talked about the shaking a few weeks ago, that there are so many people leaving the church, and praise God, there's some people coming into church as well. There's a shaking going on, and the Holy Spirit wants to find out, where do you stand in your relationship with the lovely Jesus Christ? When you see the secular world coming into the church, and you hear of the political world, and you hear of all the violence going across the world, and... uh, Even nature itself is turning against us. Is anybody with me today with tornadoes and hurricanes? Are you going to remain faithful to Jesus Christ? Is anybody with me? So we talked about the shaking. People come going out of the church because they're overwhelmed and people coming in. And then last week we talked about, are you going to be moved? I shall not be moved. Is anybody with me? Just like the tree that's planted by the waters. I shall not be moved, that no matter what I hear, not, no matter what I see, I'm going to keep my relationship with the lovely Jesus Christ. I will not be shaken out. I shall not be moved, so that when Jesus comes from those eastern skies, I, lo- I can look him face to face. And everybody said amen. So today, we're talking about the shaking. We're talking about, are you going to remain faithful to Jesus Christ? But today, we're going to talk about this lovely Jesus with his broad shoulders, even though you may have left the church. You've given up your relationship with Christ. He is out to find you and bring you back. Amen. And Christ's shoulders are broad enough and strong enough to carry you back, just like he did the sheep. And everybody said, amen. That's what we're going to talk about today. So let's go to John 10, 10 in your Bibles today. It's called the Good Shepherd. Uh, That's John 10, 10. Here's what the Bible says. Uh, The thief, Satan cometh not, Jesus said, but to steal. And he went on to say that Satan comes to kill and Satan comes to destroy. Who do you think sent those hurricanes this last week? It wasn't God. It was Satan. He's out to destroy, to kill, to maim, and take you away from Jesus Christ. But listen to this here. He said, Satan cometh not but to steal. Uh, He came to kill. He came to destroy. But here's what Christ said. This is what the good shepherd said. This is the one with the broad shoulders. Here's what he said. I come that ye may have life. Come on. And that you and I might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Everybody say amen. But here, this is what this commentary says. Christ refers to himself uh, as the good sheep, Susan. Uh, The Jews could relate to a shepherd. The Gentiles could relate to a shepherd. Jesus, as the kind, compassionate shepherd who loves his sheep, has entered. Listen, Jesus Christ, because of his grace and mercy and love, uh, he tolerates our sins. He doesn't condone it. But all the while, 
You're out in the world sinning. Jesus Christ is out there searching for you, trying to bring you back home. Again, that's the God that I serve today. Come on, somebody say amen to that. But listen to this here. The Greek word for good, Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd, is kalos. And that, here's what it means. It means one who performs his service, his service very well. Extraordinary. Outstanding. Someone that is excellent in his duties. Someone who guides. Someone who protects. And someone who loves the flock. Everybody say amen. amen. That's why if someone on the other side of that camera, you backslid. Now, what happens if you backslide? Well, if you, back, if you die in a backslidden condition, you're lost forever. Come on. There's, not, there's, no, there's no such thing. I accepted Jesus at seven. I haven't been to church. I haven't read. I haven't studied. I haven't prayed. But I'll be in the kingdom because I accepted Jesus Christ at seven years old. If you haven't kept that continual relationship with Jesus, you haven't grown in Jesus, your ways and your thoughts haven't changed, and you haven't accepted the blood of Jesus Christ and been filled with the Holy Spirit, then you're lost. And you are the very one that Christ is seeking, trying to find, to carry you back with his broad shoulders today. Because, see, God, if you do backslide, Jan, Bobby, Joe, Sally, he doesn't get mad at you. He's hurt. He wants you back. Why? Because he loves you. Amen? He wants you back. God does, it's not a tyrannical God. He's a loving, gracious, merciful, long-suffering Kind, tender-hearted. Let's go a little bit further here. Uh, 1 Peter 5, 4. Now, this is not what I think. This is what the Bible says. 1 Peter 5, 4. And when the chief shepherd, Jesus, shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Here's what this author says. Jesus Christ is called the chief shepherd since he is the head of the church. The Pope is is not a head of the church. Come on. Jesus is the head of church. Mark Finley is not a head of the church. Neither is Danny Shelton. Jesus is the head of the church. Everybody said amen? Listen to this. He is the one that laid his life down for the flock. He set the example of how to be a good shepherd. A good shepherd doesn't use power to forcefully control the flock. Jesus, the shepherd, speaks to all of us when he says, Come unto me, all you that labor, and I will give you rest. God's government is not built on force. He's not going to force you to love him. He's not going to force you to accept him. He sends the Holy Spirit out to talk to your heart, to woo you to him because of his great love. But he will never force you to do anything. The devil will always force you to do things. Amen? That's a tremendous difference in the good shepherd here. Listen to what Peter in this scripture refers to himself and the elders as shepherds of the flock. But they look to Jesus as the supreme shepherd, the chief shepherd. Why? Because he cares for the flock and he gave his life for the flock. Is anybody with me? Uh, I consider myself as a pastor, as a shepherd to lead my flock. Uh, I haven't given my life for you. I would, but Jesus already has. Amen. Uh, my blood cannot cleanse you from sin, but the blood of Jesus can. Uh, I do not have the right hand seat with God, but Jesus does. Come on. I've only been here 73 years. Jesus has always been here. Amen. Jesus' love is unconditional. He loves you regardless of the state. If you are a prostitute today, Jesus loves you. Does he condone what you're doing? No. <laughs> if you're a drug addict and you're out uh, robbing and stealing for your drug habit, uh, God still loves you, but he can't condone what you're doing. But he says, I can help you if you just let me. Everybody say amen to that. Let's go a bit further here, what the Bible says. Hebrews 13, 20. Here's what the Bible says. Now, the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Because why did he bring Jesus back? Listen, ye were as sheep going astray, but now are returned unto the shepherd and the bishop of your soul. Because Jesus died on the cross, died for our sins, 
paid for our sins and allowed the Holy Spirit to come into our lives, it says here, He did all these things because we were astray. We were sinners, lost. And Jesus Christ gave His life for us, and He brought us back with a relationship with God because of what Jesus did, not what I did. Is that my way? It's what Jesus did, the shepherd. And the Bible tells us, and we're going to get into that in just a minute, that even though, put it this way, say Jesus has a flock of 100 people, and he loves them, and they love him. And if one leaves the flock and gets influenced by the secular world and goes back into the world, does Jesus get angry? The Bible tells us he goes out in search of them. And when he finds them, he doesn't scold them. He picks them up, and he puts them on his broad shoulders, and he carries them back. That's the God that I serve today. Amen? Let's go a bit further here. Uh, going astray means continually wandering away from the truth. And we're seeing in the Seventh-day Adventist movement and a lot of the other movements as well, so many people that were lights in the church, their lights have gone out and they've gone right back out into the world. You're thinking, how could that happen? Let's go a bit further. Going astray continually is wandering away from the church. They wander from the church. They wander away from the flock. And Satan is the one who leads men astray. Satan is the lion. He is the wolf. And his desire is to destroy you by taking you away from the truth of God's Word and do whatever possible to stop you from going back. Is anybody with me? Ezekiel 34, 11, 12, and 16. Here's what the Bible says. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search for my sheep, and I'm going to seek them out. Here's the good thing about Jesus. When He finds you, no matter how lost, how <laughs> dark your life has been without him, he doesn't mind touching you. He'll touch you. Amen? You know, uh, when we were in India, and uh, we were visiting the villages, uh, every day we go to 10 or 15 villages, and they were living in the villages just like they did 2,000 years ago. There was oxen out there. There was chickens and little pigs running through the into the homes, dirt floors. And when you would go into their homes, they would touch you and grab a hold of you because you were God's messenger. You can't be afraid to touch people. Anybody with me? And you're thinking, oh boy, I'm going to get leprosy this time because we saw leprosy. We saw all kinds of disease. They, I'm a, I'm a, but you know what? I, God sent me there not just to preach, but to be an example of Jesus Christ. So we touched them, and we hugged them. We carried the children. Is anybody with me? And everywhere you went, they followed you, everywhere. You cannot be afraid to touch people. Jesus, no matter what life that you live today, is not afraid to touch you. He wants to touch you. And we talked about it a couple weeks ago. That's the reason Jesus came in the flesh. He wanted to hold his people and touch his people. He loved his people. He picked up their children. They sat on his lap. He hugged people. He touched them. He healed them. And he cried for them. That's the Jesus that I serve. That's the Jesus with the broad shoulders today. Willing to take the responsibility. Let's go a bit further. It's not. Listen to them. Anyone. Now listen. No matter your race or your creed should lead the church of Christ. And when you do, whether you're black or white or red or yellow, Japanese, German, whatever you may be, he knows when you leave the church, and he cares. Because what have we said this over and over, Doug? You've heard me say it a thousand times. When Jesus looks down, he sees his babies. He doesn't see color. He sees babies. And when the baby's lost, he goes and finds them. And everybody said amen. Let's go a bit further here. As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day, that he is among his sheep. They, listen, and if they get scattered, I will go out after my sheep, Jesus said. And I will deliver them out of all the places where they've been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. I'm going to tell you something. Those shepherds in Jesus' time, they gave their lives for their sheep. And if you go dig into history... The shepherds knew their sheep 
They knew their personality. They knew what type of grass they liked. They knew what type of water they liked. They cared for them. They fought off wolves. They fought off lions. Is anybody with me? They would give their life for the sheep, and many of them did. So Jesus, knowing we could relate to that, said, I am the shepherd. I love my sheep. I'll give my life for my sheep. Let's go a bit further here. Wherever they may be, no matter how lost they may be, Christ says, I will go. Get this. There is no place so dark or so evil or so far from the truth that you can be hid from me. Christ, I see all, they hear all, and they know all. So it's saying here. Maybe you're living in a drug house. Maybe you're living in the slums. Maybe you're walking the streets with a backpack. Jesus knows where you're at. No matter the lifestyle that you've lived, how evil, how unrighteous, how dark, how unacceptable it may be, how disgusting it may be, Jesus still wants to save you. And when he finds you, no matter what condition you're in, no matter how filthy you may be, he just reaches right down, picks you up, and puts you on his shoulders. Now, that's the God that I serve today. So when anybody says, God, if you push him too far, he'll bring the hammer down on you. I don't like that because that's a lie. That is a lie. I can tell you this. If God, every time I disappointed him or I fell, I'd have big knots all over my head from the hammer. <laughs> God picks you up. God reassures you. God wipes the tears from your eyes. God changes your clothes into a white robe of righteousness. God cleans you up. God feeds you. God waters you. God takes care of all your needs. Is anybody with me? Wow. Mm, 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 mm. I will bring them out for my people and gather them from the countries. I will bring them out of their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers and in all of the inhabited places of the country. Listen to this. The ideals and the philosophies and the principles of the secular world are in direct opposition to the truth of the Bible. Everything that the secular world teaches is against what the Bible teaches. And yet, Christian people are drawn and influenced and leave their church and go right back out into the secular world. Wow. Peter. 1 Peter 5, 8. Here's what the Bible says. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now, being sober doesn't mean don't get drunk. Stay If you do, stay sober. It means be aware of your surroundings. Be aware of the philosophies and the teachings of the secular world. You know, without question, you go to a school today, and they're teaching our children that uh, the universe heated up, and it blew up, and the Big Bang Theory happened, and here we are. The Bible says that God took the time in six days and created everything. See? And direct opposition of what the Bible teaches. But listen to this right here. Proverbs 4, 4, 23. Here's what the Bible says. Listen to this, Roseanne. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of all the issues of life. Now, what that means is there's a carnal heart, there's a spiritual heart. When I had a carnal heart, heart I wanted the things what the world had to offer. Gary, you did too. Rosemary, Brenda, we all did, Bob Joe. But when I accepted Christ, and the Holy Spirit came to live within me, my whole life changed. My thoughts, where I go, how I speak, how I treat people, it all changed because now I want to see Jesus now. <laughs> I'm not interested in winning the lottery. I want to see Jesus now. My last words, and Jeannie was there. My last words my father spoke, I want to see Jesus. Come on. I tell you what, when I leave this world, that's my last words. I want to see Jesus. I want Jesus. Is that my way? <laughs> Dad didn't ask for another 10 years of life. He didn't ask to see Mom. He didn't say, where's Donnie? He said, I want Jesus. Come on. Somewhere along the line, 
Jesus found dad and he carried him back to the flock. <laughs> dad wanted to see the good shepherd. It's the commentary. Here's what it says. Purity of mind or of the heart is the first requisite for a sinless life. It is out of the abundance of the heart that good or evil comes into our lives. Sin is the indulging of the desires of the world. Can you me? Hence the need for diligence in keeping the mind surrounded to God, in God, through God. That's what will keep us on the right road of righteousness that will lead to the cross, that will lead to heaven, is living on the biblical principles. Biblical! principles, and having a daily walk with the lovely Jesus as well. Listen to this one. Jesus, the good shepherd, shall say, I'm on a mission. What is Jesus' mission? I'm on a mission to save. Luke 19, 10, here's what the Bible says. For the Son of Man came to save that which was lost. What was lost? Us. <laughs> we are the sheep, and Jesus is the good shepherd. Uh, 1 Timothy 1.15, here's what the Bible says. Listen to this. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all exceptions. Put everything aside if you've ever heard, listen to this, that Jesus Christ came in the world to save sinners, and Paul said, I'm the chief of sinners. It boils down to your life. Are you a Christian or are you living in the secular world? Do you love Jesus or do you love the world? Have you been washed in the blood or are you following Satan today? It all boils down to that. And Paul said, I'm the chief of sinners. And even Jesus came out to save me. Listen to this right here. Worthy in the Greeks, the fundamental teaching is fundamental that Jesus, the good shepherd, came to redeem and be accepted without hesitation or doubt. And in the eyes and the mind and the heart of the lost sheep, which was restored to the flock, this is our hope and joy. Without Christ, there is no hope of being in heaven. Right. You may keep the Ten Commandment law. You may keep all the biblical principles. You may keep the Sabbath. But unless you have a one-on-one -on -one personal relationship with Jesus and you daily strive to be more like Jesus, and you're studying your word, and you're praying, and your sincere desire is to be in heaven. Unless you follow that path every day, you'll, eventually you will stray, and you will leave the church. Is anybody with me today? Listen to this here. Mark 2, 17. And when Jesus heard it, he says unto the scribes and Pharisees concerning the publicans and sinners, they that are whole have no need of physician, but they that are sick. When you are poisoned with sin, you're sick. <laughs> I came not to call the righteous. I came to call sinners to repentance. But listen to what Jesus said. Listen to what this author says. Are, are you with me? Here's what it says. Jesus was saying, I will supply the needs of the flock or the church. I'll supply all your needs. I will guide you. I will protect you. I will bless you. But if you should decide to backslide or leave these rich pastors of blessing, I will not force you to stay. Ooh. He's not going to make you stay in the church. God gave us free will, and we make that decision. Serve him or don't serve him. So when you want to leave the church, God doesn't say, oh, no, you're not. No, no, you're standing right here. He will allow you to leave the church. But he says this, if you do, I will search for you. How can I not? <laughs> you know what I said? If you should decide to leave your relationship with Christ, he's not going to get mad at you. He says, when you do, I'm going to come looking for you. How can I not? I died for you. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Why does Christ go looking for you? Here's what it says. My love for you propels me forward in an endless search for the lost and dying soul. 
Whew. That's the God that I serve today. Jerry, Jeannie, you still with me back there? That's the God that I serve today. But this is what the Bible says in Luke 15, 4 and 5. Now, what man of you, Jesus said, having a hundred sheep. Now, that's a bunch. If you lose one of them, not leave the 99 and go out into the wilderness, and you go to find them that was lost, and you will not come back to the flock till you find them? Is anybody with me? It seems to me, I don't know, I've never been a shepherd of sheep, but if I had a hundred and one left, I'd say, well, you know, sheep, they're mine. They were desperate if they lost one. If just one left the flock, they'd go look for them. And the shepherd would take his staff and search day and night through the thickets and the briars and the creeks and the wilderness until they found that sheep. And they never scolded the sheep. I loved it. The story said they would just pick them up, put them on their shoulders, and bring them home. <laughs> it says here, as Jesus spoke to the men gathered around him, he spoke a parable that each man could relate to. In that geographical area that Jesus was visiting, there were many shepherds. Are you with me, Gary? So the shepherds could easily identify with the story that Jesus was revealing. You know what I like about Jesus? Boy, did he make it plain and simple. He didn't try to use words that long. So many times I, I, I've been listening to messages, Jan, and they're speaking, and I got my dictionary trying to find out what that word means. You know, you don't have to do that. Jesus always identified with the people. And everybody said amen. I love that. So listen to this. So searching for lost sheep was a daily ritual with those shepherds. The loss of even one sheep was heavy loss, not only financially, but the shepherd felt responsibility for each and every sheep. Oh, whoo, here we go. This generation coming up, I'm just going to say it like it is. They're sort of lazy. They're lazy. You, you, you can't get the teeny boppers to do anything, even if you give them money. They're lazy. They're slothful. And I think it's our fault. Somewhere along the line, it's our fault, Doug. Maybe we babied our children too much. Maybe we babied our grandbaby children so much. We don't let them do anything. We do everything for them. God allows us as his children to go through things. And we go through them. And when we get ourselves in trouble, we look up and say, Lord, I need your help. They learn by trial and error. Is anybody with me today? So I'm not happy with this generation coming up. I see too many young folks carrying backpacks, sleeping in the fields, in old buildings. In fact, uh, a couple months ago, there was one sleeping out in my son's yard. Uh, he had a, I don't know, a blanket on the ground. He had an old bicycle and he had a backpack. And so I went over to him and I said, what are you doing? <laughs> he said, what? I said, what are you doing with your life? Oh, I love this life. I said, you love this life? You don't have any money. You have no food, no place to take a shower. You don't have a roof over here. I love it. He said, I have no responsibility, and I don't have to do anything. Now, see, that's what we're dealing with. Come on, somebody. Did I scold him? No, I gave him some money for breakfast. But that ain't the point. <laughs> he looked hungry. I'm just saying we're dealing with this. But praise God. We do have some young folk. We got one back there in the booth right now, run this broadcast, who works day and night, not only for uh, his ministry, but for the Lord. <laughs> his mama and daddy and his brother, they're all involved in these things. I love that, don't you? Come on, somebody. But as a whole, I'm seeing a movement going on in this younger generation that they deserve entitlement. They don't have to do anything, but I deserve everything. Is anybody with me? I can tell you this. If I get to heaven and I'm looking forward to it, I'm not entitled to it. I didn't do anything. Jesus did it all. <laughs> I'm not entitled to it. It was a gift. Come on, somebody. I can't work my way into heaven. I can't buy my way into heaven. If you see my bank account, you see why I can't. I can't steal myself. I, I can't do it. Heaven is a gift. 
from the lovely Jesus Christ, the Good Shepherd. But listen right here. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I'll make it clear to everyone out there. Let's make it clear today. There is God. There is His Son, Jesus. And there's the Holy Spirit. They're the Trinity, the Godhead. Am I with me? They are God. That's what God is. <laughs> They're different entities, but that's what God is. The Holy Spirit. There's three of them. There's not one. There's not two. There's three. That's why Jesus said, I will send He, the Holy Spirit. I will send Him to you. Is anybody with me? So there's the Holy Spirit, and there's Jesus, and then there's God. So there's three, and they are God. Come on. But they're different entities, but they're still God. I'm going to make that clear today, what the Seventh-day Adventist Church teaches. Is anybody with me? Here's what a man told me a few years ago. Didn't even claim to be a Christian. Here's what he said. I believe that God created man's heart big enough that he could love everybody. It's there. You don't think you can love everybody. You know, I, what if I said this over and over? I was raised in a family of eight children. Rosemary, you, Jerry, you, you were part of that. Um, and there was a, a, a large years between us. <laughs> you know, you had one with a beard going off to war, and then you had one that mama, that mama was given a bottle. So there was a, a vast years between us eight. And um, it was a big family. And my mom and dad had tremendous responsibilities. But I'm saying is, when I was there, I had all these brothers and sisters. Mom, I didn't think there was room to love anybody else. Is anybody with me? Then you have your children. There's room. Then you have your grandbabies. There's room. Then you have your brothers and sisters in Christ. There's room. Then you have a real close friend. There's room. Then you meet somebody. You love them right off the bat. There's room. So God made your heart big enough. You can love everybody. You may not be happy with the way they live or condone what they're doing, but you know what? Um, Will Rogers said, I've never met a man that I didn't even like. That's what he said. You remember him? That's what he said. I thought, I've met a few people. I bet if you could meet them, you wouldn't like them. But, they're right. but God did. It's amazing. When you get with someone, you begin to love that person. Is anybody with me? So God made our heart big enough. I think sometimes we block people out. We don't want them in. But listen right here. In John 10, 30, here's what Jesus said. I, my Father, and I, we're one. We're one in thought. We're one in deed. We're one in love. Is anybody with me? Jesus made it clear. His unity with the Father, His will, His purpose, His objective, and His goals, they were all the same. The Father was behind every word and every plan and every action that Jesus did. <laughs> Every one of them, implicating the close relationship between the Son and the Father. Because in John 1, 1, what the Bible says, we're talking about Jesus Christ, the one with the broad shoulders. In the beginning was the Word. Who was the Word? Jesus. And it says that He was with God. And it says the Word was God. Wow. Word in the Greek is legos. It means designated Word for Jesus. God expressed His divine will and His purpose and His love through Jesus Christ, his representative. Because Jesus said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Is that all right? Am I with me? Because they, they're just alike in every way, Sally. Every way. You know, uh, uh, last week uh, I went to see a surgeon, and uh, I'd never met him before. Uh, he's friends with my son, who's an ER doctor. And I'd never met him. And we had a great time. And he called Donnie that night, and he said, the first word your dad said, I, that's Donnie's dad. Every action, every movement, everything that I saw, he said, Donnie, that was you. I want when someone sees me, there's Jesus. <laughs> Woo. There's Jesus. He talks like him. He moves like him. He thinks like him. And that will happen when Jesus comes. We will inherit the mind of Jesus. When I get a brand new body, am I with me? Brand new body. And what have I said over and over? I'll be at least six foot tall, right, Gary? I have hair. When I get this brand new body, 
I will have the mind. In other words, I'll think like Jesus thinks. I will act like Jesus acts. I'll be everything that Jesus is. Just like my dad. So much of what my dad was, I am. I want to be so much as my father is in heaven. I am. That's our goal. Daily walk with Jesus, the walk of sanctification, to be like Jesus. Is everybody with me so far? Listen to this here. Hebrews 1, 1, 2, and 3. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spoke to us by the fathers and the prophets, but in these last days he spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world, who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Before Jesus came, we had prophets, didn't we? They gave us the word. But then Jesus came. He gave us his word. And by seeing Jesus, I see who the Father is. And it says that Jesus was the express image of, of his father. You know what express means? In every detail. Jesus was God. <laughs> every detail. He was God. But this is what the Bible says. As the shepherd gathers his sheep and his lambs. Carrying those that are too feeble to walk. So Christ exercises every possible care for his church, his flock. God the Father, now this is my favorite writer. God the Father is not an unfeeling master or a cruel tyrant, but the embodiment of consideration and love. Isaiah 53 is what the Bible says. He has borne our griefs. Christ with the broad shoulders, he's borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Jesus Christ was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we are healed. All weak, for all have sinned and come short of the God, glory of God. Listen to this. As we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. All the sins that's ever been created or done or thought or acted upon of everyone that's ever been born was placed upon the shoulders of Christ as he carried the cross up Mount Calvary. Is anybody with me? So what we're saying today, no wonder the life was literally crushed out of Christ. No wonder no mortal man had big enough shoulders to carry the sins up that Calvary's hill. It had to be Jesus, the Son of a God. It had to be a God wrapped in human flesh that had the shoulders strong enough and desired to. So the Bible says that he willingly and lovingly went to the cross for me. Jesus' shoulders was the only shoulder. Listen to the Psalms 23, 1 through 3. You know this one here. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You know what that means? After I got Jesus, I don't need nothing. <laughs> Come on. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Oh, he restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Is anybody with me? Yes. I'm going to close. I've got four or five more pages to go. I think I'll save those. <clears throat> There's somebody out there today. You're lost. You were in the church. Hey, you were a deacon. You were an elder. You were a deaconess. You were a pastor. Just a few years ago, a pastor in this Benton area was put in prison. He backslid. Does God still love him? <laughs> yeah, sure he does. Does God still want him back? Into the church, sure he does. Has God been to him, talked to him already? I bet he has. I bet Jesus has gone to the prison to talk to him. But there's somebody out there today, uh, you've backslidden, and you feel so lost and that nobody cares. I know somebody, and he knows you, and he knows exactly where you're at today. 
Maybe you're an adulteress and your husband doesn't know you're having an affair. Or your wife doesn't know you're having an affair. God does. Is it forgivable? Oh, yeah. Can God restore that marriage? Through the power of God, it can be done. Have you embezzled money from the bank? Are you a thief? Are you a prostitute? Do you beat your wife? Now, there's people out there. That's what our world's made of. We're all sinners. Does that make me better than you? No. We're all sinners saved by grace. We all have our own little issues, problems. God knows where you're at today. And he wants to save you. You don't know it, but Jesus is already there. <laughs> Arms wide open. He wants to pick you up and carry you back to his church. You might be an Adventist, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Catholic. You could be in any denomination. I think that God's church is not necessarily the Baptist or Methodist. I think God's church is composed of everyone that's born again. And yes, there will be Adventists there too. <laughs> There'll be Baptists there, Catholics there. Am I with you? There'll be those there that never attended church but gave their life to Christ on their last breath. God knows right where you're at today. This is the day that you need to turn your life back to Christ. He sent this message for you. Lovely Christ. Good shepherd, son of the living God, my friend, my Savior, my King. I thank you, Father, that you were willing to send Jesus and that Jesus willingly accepted this plan of salvation, knowing he would be beaten and whipped and die upon a cross naked. But because of his great love for his children, he willingly and lovingly said, I accept, Father. I will redeem my people by the shedding of my blood. And oh, by the way, Father, give me some strong shoulders to carry the sins of the world. It's going to be a long 2,000-foot walk from Jerusalem to Golgotha's Hill. Give me the strength. So, Lord, today there's people out there behind that camera that are seeking you. Let them know that Jesus is already there. You know where they're at. You love them. You want to forgive them. The door's wide open. Come unto me, all you that labor, labor, and I will give you rest. I will give you peace unto your souls. I will enable you tonight to lay your head upon that pillow and say, I've been forgiven. I'm a child of the king. What peace he restoreth my soul. Lord, thank you for this message. Thank you for Tim and Sally today. Thank you for uh, our friends, Susan and Bill and Roseanne and John and June. Our friends today, we think of Carolyn that wasn't able to make it today. We think of our church congregation. We think of our nucleus here. Give us the strength and the power through the Spirit to continue this ministry until we see the face of Christ. We praise you, Father, and we thank you in advance, not just for what you've done, but for what you're about to do if we remain faithful. In Jesus' name, amen.